from the book of Isaiah. Listen. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good tidings, who publishes peace, who brings good tidings of good, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Hark, your watchmen lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And there we end in our reading from the Old Testament. from God's word, <clears throat> this time in the New Testament, from the Gospel of John. Listen to this, the first 14 verses of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony, 
to bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. The true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. He came to his own, his own people received him not, but to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. And there we end in our reading for this evening. Did, uh, did you understand those readings? Good. There's a young man in the front who goes, mm-hmm. Yep. Now, the adults over here, not a one of them's going, no, I don't want to admit. They don't know any more about it than I do. And it's confusing to me. Listen to this in, from John. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Who? And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. The life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. Does any of that, if you read it, make sense? Even if you slow it down, it doesn't make sense. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. What Word is this? How many, how many words do you suppose can be found in the Bible? From Genesis to, uh, to Revelation, how many words do you suppose there are? Do you suppose that one of those is the word they're talking about? What is he talking about, John? He's talking, he's talking like a Greek because John had a Greek background. He's talking like someone who thinks differently than, than Americans think or than Hebrews think. And he thinks with them with expression. He thinks with expansion. He uses words that mean this, but he, he expresses them as though they meant this much. They mean a lot more than what you and I would assume. So John can write this way, and some other Greeks would understand it, but not everybody did, nor does. I can't say that I actually understood this for, for decades. It wasn't until I probably was in my 50s before I had a grasp on this, and still my grasp slips, and I'm not sure exactly what it means. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony to bear witness to the light, the light that all might believe through him. Through who? The light? John? The light can't be a him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness to the light. Are we talking about, who are we talking about here? Doesn't, is it just me? Am I the only one that gets lost in all of this? Or do maybe sometimes you do too? Are you really clear on what all this is? The true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. He made the world. The world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. How do we go around in that circle and not come up somewhere thinking positively or negatively? We don't. We don't. So why do we read this? Why is it part of scripture? And why on this night, why do we read this that's only going to confuse us, that's only going to leave us us half empty? only half understanding because there is understanding in this in this passage from John there's great understanding but we need to we need to read it frequently we need to ponder it we need to come to an understanding of how Hebrews spoke how how what words meant what we have to come to an understanding of of what they were intending and then it begins to make some sense to us So the word became flesh. John declares that this word actually came to earth in the form of a human being, Jesus of Nazareth, and was seen by human eyes. This word is not a word as we know it. It is an awareness. It's a thought. It's a vision, an experience. This word that comes into the world in the person of Jesus of Nazareth is something that we will never completely understand. We can only begin to accept we can only 
have an awareness of who Jesus is. We will never know completely. We will only have a, a thought about him, a vision of him. And we can, if we're lucky and wait, have an experience of him. Where he comes to us and speaks to us through scripture or through prayer or through patient waiting. And he speaks to us and encourages us. And we aren't left alone or wondering, not in the dark, not on this night. The lights are on. We see clearly now. He is with us. He has come to us. God himself has come and he has left himself with us. What is this word? A secret? In Greek, the word word has a variety of connotations. It can mean uh, something having to do with wisdom or power. It's not a living being, as it seems to imply, but is the human experience of knowledge. What is this word, the word that came? It was a description of our human experience that begins to give us knowledge. And the word was a word that was with God and was God. The word was a being in the beginning with God who was there to help God, to be with God, to uphold God, to work with God, to encourage him. In him, this word was life. And the life was the light of all people. The light that shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. This word is the word of a human being who comes into the world in a miraculous birth with a mission that only he could accomplish because he is also divine. The word became flesh. To the Greeks, this is an impossibility. Remember, John had some Greek background and, uh, and there were lots of Greeks living. They were traders and so they would travel throughout the Middle East and they would trade goods and they would share their beliefs of God and their experiences and they would hear others. But the Greeks would never have understood this. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. That would have baffled them. The word has common Haitians. In Greek, every word has connotations. It has connotations of, of power, uh, of wisdom, but it's not a living being. What is living is the human experience of knowledge. When words are shared with us, when words become powerful to us, words like forgiveness, joy, intimacy, caring, thoughtfulness, hope, those love, those words, begin to strengthen us in our faith and in our lives and in our relationships. The word became flesh. It's not just an impossibility for the Greeks, it, it's an impossibility for us. We are related more in our language and understanding to the Greeks than we are to the Hebrews. And, and so we have that same kind of mentality. What do you mean the word became flesh? That's impossible, but not for God. Don't forget, not for God. The Greeks would never have thought of God in a human body. This was more than they could imagine. This was a shattering new idea that God could and would become a human person. That God could enter into the life that we live. That God could enter in and, and, have, and know all of the, the graceful things the wonderful things of life and all the disappointments of life that God would allow himself and submit to this in the person of Jesus of Nazareth is more than we would normally think unless we hear this again and again and it begins to take some sense to us and we begin to understand who God was and is and what he is doing and has done then we begin to make some sense that God could enter into this life that we live that eternity could appear in time, that somehow the creator could appear within the creation in such a way that people's eyes and experience could actually be opened up and they could see him. Have you seen him? Have your eyes opened? In all the years that you have been coming to church and reading the Bible and knowing about church, but maybe others weren't completely committed to God in Christ, 
Have you ever thought about these things? Oh, I have. I have. And now I wish I could parse it for you. I could take it all apart. This is what God has done, and this is where the Holy Spirit, and this is how they come together, and this is His Son, Jesus, and the best I can do is, is a triangle that, that reflects the, the triune God, the God that is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost all at once. All I can do is, is say that I think that is possible, and I have experienced all three as, as part of my faith and my life. I have been lifted up by all of them. I know that God has been behind me all my life, and I know that Jesus Christ has come into the world in person, in a human being, and given himself up for us, that we might know life and forgiveness and eternal life and the promise of God, and that they will all be ours. And I have read and studied and prayed to the God who made himself known in Jesus of Nazareth, did so with a reason and a purpose. If a person, if a God came into the world, could God enter into the life that we live? In the person of Jesus, he could. Could that God appear in time in any part of eternity? He's God. He can do it. Could somehow the Creator appear in creation in such a way that our eyes could actually see Him? Well, yes, He has. He has appeared in the flesh in Jesus of Nazareth, and we have been able to see Him, or at least to understand His life as we see the, the words that have spelled out His life for us. Can we see Him with our eyes? We can with our imagination. We can with our understanding. Can we see him with our imagination? Yes. It's hard to conceive, but, but we can do it. It's not surprising that people have always had a hard time believing in this Jesus of Nazareth. It is hard to believe. But as time passes, it becomes not just more believable and acceptable, but more meaningful. This Jesus of Nazareth, this one who became flesh after having been divine, who came in and gave up all that there was to be part of our lives, this one lifts us up. This is the one, this is the God who has done it all for us. This is the God who has come into the world in that tiny child. The spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that professes Jesus Christ is enriched by that profession and by that knowledge of God. It begins to mean something to us. Sometimes we're trying to say, Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. Uh, this sounds too fantastic to be believed. So we go out about our way and, and we try to avoid or ignore this divine flesh. And we cheat ourselves out of an intimate relationship, a, a deep experience with the God that is in our lives. We go about our lives and, and he's going alongside and we're paying no attention whatsoever. There are other words in the 14th verse. The 14th verse says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only son from the father. Grace and truth. Grace is something that's completely undeserved. It's a free gift, something we could not earn or win or achieve for ourselves. God came to earth in Jesus of Nazareth as an undeserved gift from him to us. Grace has the idea of, of beauty in it. People have thought of God in terms of power and judgment, but in Jesus, we're confronted by the love and the loveliness of God. He has shown how much he cares for us. It's beautiful. The other word that is conveyed there is truth. Jesus is the embodiment, embodiment of the truth. We're, we poor humans have been trying to understand God from the beginning of our existence. We've tried to understand him as personal and corporate, but it's only when we look to God in Jesus Christ that we really begin to understand who God is. 
originally, a distant and often foreboding God, always checking up on us. In Jesus Christ, he comes close to us. He talks to us. He talks to us about God. He reveals himself to us. He shows us what God is like. Jesus is the communicator, the transmitter. He's the one that enlightens us about God. He communicates in his life and in his words. He transmits to us a new understanding of the divine that no one else in all the world, no one else in all human time has ever had but us. Those who have recognized and acknowledged God in Jesus Christ and God in Jesus. We are the fortunate ones. When Jesus left earth, he left his spirit to tell us the truth and to guide us into a relationship with the true God. The truth. The truth. They sought to kill Jesus because he told them the truth. He told them who he was and who God is and what God expected of them and they didn't like it. But we've been fortunate enough to hear the truth and to not just like it, but to adore it. The truth is that which makes us three. The truth illuminates the distance between us and God. It closes the gap between us. The truth can be resented. The people sought to kill Jesus because he told them the truth. People can kill one who tells them the truth, but the truth still remains. The truth is a light to our path. It enlightens our minds and our hearts. It enlightens the darkness around us. The truth can be disbelieved when we can say, oh, this sounds too good to be true, but it is true. As time passes, we begin to recognize it and realize it, and we begin to experience it, and we find ourselves oh, confident, happy, positive, enlightened, encouraged, strengthened, loved, forgiven, all those and more, and they all make our lives more special, more important. They lift us up. These gifts that God has given to us in and through the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. The truth can be disbelieved. It sounds too good to be true. The truth is not something abstract or lost. The truth as it refers to God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is something with much be known, with, which must be known with the mind, accepted with the heart, and enact, enacted in our lives. That is our call and our opportunity to enact the truth in this life because we have sought out God and Jesus and in finding him, we are lifted up by the truth. The truth is, God did it all for you. How does that make you feel? Let us pray. Almighty God, our words are cheap and easy. Your word is powerful and filled with love and forgiveness. Forgive us when we have walked on and not listened to your word, when we have not recognized your son, when we have not been open to his word and his power in our lives. Lord, continue to uphold us, we pray, and not, not just this night and the day coming tomorrow, but all the days to come. Keep us aware of your presence and appreciative of all you have done for all your children, especially for us. For we are grateful. We are amazed. We are hopeful because of what you have done and continue to do through your Son, our Lord, Jesus of Nazareth. Amen.
follow me out this evening and live each day to come with the gifts that God has given to you and know the joy of, of sharing and loving and giving every day. Amen.